Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Ross. Uh, I'm going to talk about something similar to what James talked about in the last talk. And this is work that I've been doing along with him and Mike Bowen Colgin and Dan Wise. So as James talked about just now, uh, if you were here, um, you know, he talked about this broad concept of using the local group as a time machine. Basically, if we have good star formation histories of local group dwarfs, we can use that to make broad claims about the population of dwarf galaxies at high redshift. So I'm interested in something similar, but slightly different, which is using those star formation histories to constrain high redshift stellar mass functions. Well, so what do I mean by constrain uh, high redshift stellar mass functions? So sort of uh, Garth was hitting at this in the first talk. Uh, the, on the left here is some measurements of the stellar mass function at redshift 4. Uh, just the Schechter fit of uh, the shaded region is the uh, errors on the faint end slope alpha. And so as you can see, uh, these, two val uh, these two measurements, even though they use similar data sets, they're both uh, from candles, uh, and at their same redshift, they're actually kind of mutually exclusive. Uh, and another way to look at this problem is, or this issue is, uh, this is just uh, the plot on the right is a plot of the faint end slope alpha as a function of redshift, z. Again, showing some scatter and uncertainty. Um, so now, as Garth mentioned, we could wait for JWST uh, to sort of get a better constraint on these. But I'm a little impatient. So I was wondering if maybe we could use the local group to sort of inform uh, this. So what do I mean by inform uh, the stellar mass functions? Well. Uh, Let's start with a little bit of a thought experiment to get us in the mood. Um, so the size of the Milky Way today is about, well, the radius is about 300 kiloparsecs, uh, which translates to a volume of about 0.1 cubic megaparsecs. Uh, now if you roll that back in time to redshift 4, uh, simulations show that increases, that volume increases by a factor of about 10 to the 2.5. So that gives us a volume of about 34 cubic megaparsecs. And because the stellar mass function is basically just a density plot, you can read off values of how many galaxies you would expect in that local volume at redshift 4. Uh, so for example, let's just take 10 to the 6 stellar masses. Um, so if you just read off the values from the stellar mass function, you arrive at two pretty drastically different numbers. For the Song stellar mass function, you get about uh, 10 galaxies in this local volume at redshift 4 versus the Duncan et al. result, which gives you something like 300. So this is, so already we're kind of putting a constraint on stellar mass functions using the local group. Um, my intuition would tend to favor the song at all result, uh, but this is of course pretty dumb. So can we do a little bit better? Uh, specifically, can we use star formation histories of the local group to constrain high redshift stellar mass functions? I would say yes, but how did we do this? So the basic idea is you take uh, stellar mass functions, pick your, the, the Schechter fits, uh, pick your favorite redshift, pick your favorite data set. My favorite redshift is redshift 4. Um, and then you can combine those with halo mass functions. Uh, in this case, I use Chef Mo Tormann. And you can derive basically just an abundance matching relation. And this is what's plotted on the left here. Again, same colors, same redshift. Um, now you can combine that with cumulative halo mass functions from CDM simulations. Once again, I use the Elvis simulation, as uh, James showed in the previous work. Um, so what's plotted on the right here is the cumulative halo mass function for the Elvis halos at redshift 4. Uh, the, the shaded region shows sort of the extent of all the different halos in the Elvis simulation. Um, now specifically, uh, this is not the total uh, halo mass, uh, cumulative halo mass function. This is only the things that exist at redshift 4 that then go on to be bound substructure of the Milky Way or Andromeda at redshift 0. So anything that's destroyed or scattered is not really considered. Now, when you combine the two, you can get a cumulative stellar mass function, um, which I've plotted here on the right. Uh, again, once again, same colors, same redshift. And you can compare that to Dan Wise's data. Uh, that's what this, this black dotted line is, is just a cumulative stellar mass function at redshift 4 from Dan's data. And so you see, just as our dumb thought experiment predicted, the song at all result is kind of uh, preferred, or I would say heavily preferred. Um, and this is kind of surprising because we're using two different types of HST data. We're using Dan Wise's star formation histories and stellar mass functions, uh, including extrapolating those stellar mass functions pretty far below their completeness, about 
at 10 to the 5 sub-mass is about like two orders of magnitude below their completeness. And then combining that with CDM simulations and getting something that looks, I think, reasonable, uh, I think that's kind of surprising. Um, now, of course, there are some limitations to this model. I just mentioned one, that we're extrapolating cellar mass functions pretty far below their completeness and just assuming that the Schechter fits are kind of given. Um, additionally, we are limited to within 300 kiloparsecs of the Milky Way and galaxies of stellar mass above 10 to the 5, basically just due to completeness of Dan Wise's sample. Uh, additionally, we're limited in redshift space. We're limited on a high redshift end by just the resolution of the star formation histories. Once again, something that James mentioned, we don't really get very far beyond redshift 5 unless you make some assumptions about the star formation histories, the burstiness and whatnot. Um, on the low redshift side, we are uh, limited by accretion out of the Milky Way. So the basic idea is that, the, the, the basic premise of this entire work is that at high redshift, the local group star formation histories are unbiased relative to the general population of dwarf galaxies. Now that's certainly not going to be true once a majority of these galaxies have been accreted by the Milky Way. So we want to kind of stop our analysis once that's happened. Um, yeah? Just a clarification. Your cumulative mass function which you started at Redshift 4 from the simulation, that was a mass function of the subtail of Redshift 0 that's applied to Redshift 0? Yes. Or it includes also one that they've disrupted? Not in, does not include things that are disrupted. Um, so, uh, yeah, so some studies have basically said that most satellites in the Milky Way have been accreted after Redshift 2. Uh, there are some examples. Um, so we stop our analysis at Redshift 2. So returning to just the cumulative stellar mass functions, um, we can do something a little bit better. Uh, instead of just plotting a bunch of stellar mass functions, just seeing which one looks the best, we can actually go ahead and fit the faint end slope. So basically what we do is uh, fix the uh, normalization and m star, the characteristic mass of the Schechter function, to literature values, and then just leave alpha as a free parameter and see what we get. So this is the result from uh, just doing that with Song et al. And as you can see, you might not be even, even be able to tell the difference between the two lines. There's a dotted magenta line and a solid magenta line. Uh, one of, the solid one is our best fit. The dashed is the fiducial result. Um, and so again, once again, we see you, Pretty remarkable agreement. Now, so there's this plot. So where does this leave us? Uh, there's this plot that I showed at the beginning of just alpha as a function of z. So we did this analysis of multiple redshifts, uh, two through five. And so these are the results. The black points are our results. So even at you know redshift between redshift two and five, we're pretty consistent with current measurements of the stellar mass function. Uh, we tend to favor shallower or less negative slopes. Also, we don't really see too much evolution with redshift. There's a slight steepening, um, which is kind of reported in literature, but it's kind of unclear. Um, so how could this be wrong? Um, so uh, basically, I, I've kind of mentioned this, but it's, it's uh, good to emphasize this. Um, the initial assumption is that the local group star formation histories are unbiased compared to the general population of galaxies at high redshift. Now, uh, that's a good, I think that's a good guess, but we really don't know. And that, 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 that certainly might not be true. I think the power of this method um, is that it provides, you know, some sort of a testable prediction. You know, our faint end slopes are a prediction for what future surveys uh, should measure for the faint end slope. Now, of course, if this assumption is wrong and future measurements of the stellar mass function get something different, well, that tells us, that will hopefully tell us something about how exactly the local group star formation histories are biased. Um, so, just sort of to conclude, so uh, we can use star formation histories of the local group dwarfs to help constrain the stellar mass function. Uh, because of we're using you know, local group dwarfs, we can get orders of magnitude lower than other techniques. Um, and we can also use this you know, data set to test the assumption that the local group is unbiased at high redshift. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. The observed stellar mass function for four also include any object that will merge. Sure. And that will then be probably disrupted if you measure four zero. Right. So your assumption implicit is that that's something that can be ignored. W yeah, so. So uh, what, you, you kind of have to play this game where, you know, uh, certainly the stellar mass functions at high redshift 
uh, assume or it, it include galaxies that are destroyed, but additionally, de uh, there are you know galaxies that for uh, on the the simulation side, like there are galaxies that are destroyed that wouldn't show up in Dan's sample, and so we chose to correct for that one by not including those destroyed galaxies. Uh, these, two val uh, these two measurements, even though they use similar data sets, they're both uh, from candles, uh, and at their same redshift, they're actually kind of mutually exclusive. Uh, and another way to look at this problem is, or claims, about the population of dwarf galaxies at high redshift. So I'm interested in something similar, but slightly different, which is using those star formation histories to constrain high redshift stellar mass functions. Well, so what do I mean by constrain? Uh, high redshift star mass function. So sort of awesome. uh, Hi, my name is Andrew Gross. Uh, I'm going to talk about something similar to what James talked about in the last talk. And this is work that I've been doing along with him and Mike Bowen Colgin and Dan Wise. So as James talked about just now, uh, if you were here, um, you know, he talked about this broad concept of using the local group as a time machine. Basically, if we have good star formation histories of local group dwarfs, we can use that to make broad. Uh, Garth was hinting at this in the first talk. Uh, the, on the left here is some measurements of the stellar mass function at redshift 4. Uh, just the Schechter fit of uh, the shaded region is the uh, errors on the faint end slope alpha. And so, as you can see,